The following is an EWTN special presentation.
Gloria in excelsis Deo. Te ad aures misericordiae tuae, Domine, precipus supplicantium. 
et ut petentibus desiderata concedas, fac eos quae tibi sunt placita postulare, per Dominum nostrum Iesum Christum Filium tu, qui tecum viver et reniat in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Lectio Epistole Beati Pauli Apostoli Ad Corinthios Fratres, non simus concupiscentis malorum, sicut et illi concupierunt. Neque idolo latre efficiamini sicut quidam exipsi, Quem ad modum scriptum est, sedit populus manducare et vivere, et surexerunt ludere. Neque fornicemur, sicut quidam ex ipsis fornicati sunt, et ceciderunt una die viginti tria milia. Neque tentemus Christum, sicut quida meorum tentaverum, et a serpentibus periherunt. Neque murmura veriti, sicut quida meorum murmura verunt, et perierunt ab exterminatore. Eic autem omnia in figura contingebantilis. Scripta sunt autem ad corruptionem nostram, in quos fines seculorum devenerunt. Itaque qui se existim ad stare videat necada, Pentatio vos non oprendat, nisi humana, fidelis atem Deus est. Qui nam non potietur vos tentare supra it quod potestis, sed faciet etiam cum tentatione proventum, ut posistiti sustinere. Domine, Dominus Super 
Dominus Hobbes. Et cum spiritu tu. Sequentia Sancti Evangelii, secondo Luca. Gloria Dimi Domine. Cum apropinquare Iesus Ierusalem, videns civitatem, flevit super ilam dicens, quia si conio vices et tu, et quidam in acti et tua, unque ad pacem tibi, nunc autum abscondita sunt apocolis tui. Quia veniet ies in te, et circumtabunt te inimici tui palo, et circumtabunt te, et coangustabunt te undique, et a terram prosternet te, et filios tuos qui in te sunt, et nare linquent in te lapidem super lapidem, Eo quod non conio veris tempus visitationis tue. Et ingressus in templum, in cepite icere, vendentens et illo, et ementes dicens illis, scriptum est, quia domus mea, domus orationis. Vos autem fecistis, ilam speluncam laconum, et erat ocens, quod idie in templo. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We preachers always, our job is to uh, teach the gospel, but connect it with what is going on in people's lives. So we always try to find, or commonly, we try to find some example in the news, or perhaps something happening in one's, the preacher's own personal life that may be significant, and a way to express a teaching in the gospel. Well, this is one Sunday where I did not have to struggle to find that. <laughs> Actually, not just my own personal life, but uh, so much is happening this week. And the gospel is very well suited for what we are about this week at the Napa Institute. It connects well with all that is happening. Our Lord weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps because he said to Jerusalem, if only you knew what would bring you peace. They did not know. And so instead, he said, Jerusalem would be destroyed. He is foretelling here the destruction of the city, and in particular, the definitive destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. 
what was it that would bring Jerusalem peace? It was the one who was weeping over Jerusalem. He was their peace. And so he enters into the temple and uh, begins to cleanse the temple, chasing out the uh, money changers and those who were uh, selling things. He had to cleanse the temple because this was an abomination. The temple is his father's house, a house of prayer, a sacred place. They were violating the sacred. In a certain sense, then, we could say he had to exorcise the temple, not in the formal sense, but in, in a broad sense, because wherever there is violation of the sacred, in some way or another, the evil one is active. He had to exorcise the temple to rid it of those evil influences so Jerusalem could be at peace. What instead was their reaction? Their reaction was to crucify him, him their very source of peace, of healing, and of prosperity in the true sense, not just material prosperity, but in the spiritual sense of living in harmony with God and neighbor. We know, of course, as well, shortly after his death, one of the fiercest persecutors of his followers then convert, converted and became the fiercest preacher of the gospel. Remember the words our Lord spoke to St. Paul, that moment of his conversion. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? Paul was persecuting his followers. Our Lord here very clearly is identifying himself with his church. Our Lord left us his church, his bride, his body, so that we could know the truth. We don't have to stay in darkness. We can know the truth, keep the truth, and preserve communion with him, and therefore know the peace that only he can give. And with that peace, the true happiness he wants for us in this life and the next. So we see how so often the church follows the same fate as her Lord. From the very beginning, I would like to share with you an example of this. This is a reading that comes from the Office of Readings, from the uh, Liturgy of the Hours. In the Office of Readings, there are two longer readings, one from Scripture and one from usually a father of the church. I would like to share these reflections with you from uh, an anonymous letter in uh, the time of the early church. The author speaks about how Christians, they live everywhere and they're seemingly indistinguishable because they follow the customs of the land where they live and the way they dress and the food they eat, uh, the places where they live. But he says there's something extraordinary about them because they don't really, they're not really at home there. They're passing through this world. He says they play their full role as citizens but labor under all the disabilities of aliens because this is not their true homeland. Their true homeland is in heaven. But then he says this, Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. He says they suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse. They are, are, are attacked and persecuted, yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. He goes on then to explain how Christians are to the world as the soul is to the body. He says that the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it. Just as Christians are found in all cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. He says the body hates the soul and wars against it not because of any injury the soul has done it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasure. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. This then is our fate too, the fate of the Lord. And what the author here says seemed to, seems to be ever more the case in our own day. It seems like not much has changed. 
The Catholic Church, I firmly believe, has the answers our nation needs right now. I think the Catholic Church is the only thing that can save our country at this time. That might be a very bold statement. And it's not because of any merit of our own, but the Lord found the church to keep us in the truth. Because of our Lord and his church, we can understand the comprehensive vision of human dignity. And we can make the connections of how we affirm human dignity all throughout. We have a body of moral teaching and a body of social teaching that must work together for the flourishing of the society and of the individual. We understand how all of life and the thriving of a society is connected with our worship. Our worship is really the heart of the matter. We understand how faith and reason must work together, not one without the other or neither, as I think is happening nowadays. But we need both to know the truth so that we might be free, happy, and at peace. Worship is the heart of the matter. Our relationship with God must be rightly ordered or everything will be askew. That means we must have a proper respect for the sacred, for the sacred. Our spirituality is the deepest, most intimate part of who we are. If we do not respect God and the sacred, we will not respect our neighbor. We will not respect human life and dignity. We understand that we must affirm that dignity at every stage and in every condition. And that includes a broad range of issues that are often found on the opposite sides of the political spectrum. As I was fond of telling the confirmation students whom I had the privilege to confirm this year, our agenda is not a political agenda. It's a gospel agenda. The political approach will not work as a philosophical basis. Political solutions are important. They can be helpful but they are only helpful if they are based on a proper understanding of the human person as made in the image and likeness of God. I would like to thank this opportunity, as so many other have this week, to thank uh, Mr. Bush and all those who have worked so hard to make this Napa Institute possible. This is so important, promoting this comprehensive vision, a truly Catholic worldview, an understanding of how the universe is ordered, and that we must conform ourselves to this order. And the more we do so, the more we will know peace, prosperity, and security. I think it's much the same now as in our Lord's time in this gospel story. Our society, too, now needs to be exercised of certain damaging uh, elements, false philosophies, unjust political agendas, corrupt value systems, and so forth these corrupting elements that undermine true peace building. The church seeks to do that, but it seems the more she does so, the more she is persecuted. It is so good to be here, to be with one another. Don't we wish life could be like this all the time? <laughs> I've been reflecting on that the last few days. <laughs> But I realize there's a problem with that. The problem is God is calling us to greatness. I think especially at this moment in history, God is calling us to greatness. And no one can achieve greatness by living an easy life. Greatness in God's eyes can only be achieved through struggle. God has given our generation plenty of opportunity to achieve this greatness in his eyes. Let us not let him down. Yes, it is good to be together, just as the apostles Peter, James, and John on Mount Tabor, who witnessed the Lord's transfiguration. But they had to descend from that mountain and go back into the world to start building a world informed and transformed by the teaching of the gospel. We have much rebuilding to do. Let us seize this opportunity with the grace of God so that we may achieve greatness in his sight, the peace, prosperity, and happiness to which he is calling us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Spiro in unum Deum. Patrem omnipotentem, factor in celi et terre, visibilium omnium, et invisibilium, et in unum Dominum.
ya saecula saeculorum. Dominus fohobiscu, et cum spiritu tuo, sursum corda, Gratias agamus, Domino Deo nostro, Dignum et justum est, Vere dignum et justum est, Equum et salutare, Nos tibi semper et ubique gratias agere, Domine Sancte Pater Omnipotens Eterne Deus, qui cum unigenito Filio Tuo et Spiritus Sancto, unus est Deus, unus est Dominus, non in unius singularitate personae, sed in Unius Trinitate substantiae, quod enim de tua gloria revelante te credimus, hoc de filio tuo, hoc de spiritu sancto, sine differentia discretionis sentimus. Ut in confessione vere sempiterne que deitatis, et in personis proprietas, et in essentia unitas, et in maestate adoreture qualitas. Quam laurent angeli adque archangeli, Cherubim quoque ac serafim, qui non cesan clamare quotidie, una voce dicentes. Sanctus.
place that's important to me. Omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Oremus. Precepti salutaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. Pater noster qui es in celis, Sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicur in celo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis horie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, Sicur et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et, no, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Sed liberam nos amalo. Omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini, sit semper vobiscu. Et cum spiritum tuo.
omnipotenti, beati Maria sempre virgini, beato Michele Arcangelo, beato Ioni Baptiste, Sancti Apostoli Petro e Paolo, omnibus sancti et ibi pater, qui abicavi nimis, cogitazione verbo et opere, mea colpa, mea colpa, mea maxima colpa. Ir io prego, beato Mariam sempre virginem, beato Michele Macangelum, beato Mionem Baptistam, Sanctus Apostolos Petrum et Paulum, omnes sanctos et te pater, orare pro me ad dominum Deum nostrum. Miseriatra Vestri Omnipotens Deus, et imisis peccatis vestris, perducat vos ad vitam eternam. Indulgentiam absolutionem et remissionem peccatorum vestrorum, tribuat vobis omnipotens et misericors dominus. Ecce anus Dei, ecce qui tollet peccata mundi.
Dominus Fobisco, et cum spiritu tuo, oremus. Tu in obis quesimus Domine, communio sacramenti et purificationem conferat, et tribuat unitatem, per Dominum nostrum Iesum Christum filium tuum, Qui te convivere et reniat in unitate spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Amen. 
Dominus Fobisco. Et cum Spiritum Tuo. Auditorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Qui fecit celum et terra. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. 